Lester Levinson was born in 1909. Lester, I find to be an absolutely fascinating human being. He grew up in a good home. When it was time for college, he had a scholarship to Rutgers University. He majored in physics. He became an engineer, very highly intelligent person, made lots and lots of money had a penthouse overlooking Central Park in Manhattan. It was a neat, neat, neat life that he was living, but he realized he wasn't very happy. He was a lonely guy. He didn't have a, a, a wife, didn't have a partner. He lived alone. He made lots and lots of money. He had everything that money could buy that he could want. And he was unhealthy. He had lots of health issues. He said hyper acidity in his body, an appendicitis, he had kidney stones, he had migraine headaches, he was extremely depressed. It was a tough existence for him. When he was 42 years old, he had his second major coronary. He was in the hospital for weeks. Dr. Schultz was his general practitioner, came into the hospital one day and said, Mr. Levinson, we're gonna let you go home today. We've done everything we can for you. You need to go home, you need to take it easy, and you need to be restful. And he said, great, doctor, thank you for the good care. When will I be back to normal? The good doctor walked over to the window and looked out for a minute, and he got real serious, and he said, Lester, this is the new normal for you. You had a massive heart attack. The damage is irreparable. You're gonna have to stay in bed and take it easier for the rest of your life. It's an absolute miracle that you lived through that last heart attack. He, Lester got angry. He started fuming and, and told the doctor, why in the world would you keep me alive if I can't have a life anymore? He was so angry, he started to cough, he started to gag, he eventually threw up, he was so angry. The good doctor had a bedpan and stuck it under his chin while he was in the bed, went to the bathroom to dump the bedpan and as he was there, he leaned over the sink and he just tried to collect himself. Even though he was a physician and often had to deliver bad news, he hated to do this for a 42 year old man who was gonna be so sick for the rest of his life. He came back in, he said, well, you need to really, really take it easy. Never walk up stairs. And he said, you need to get some loafers. And he said, I hate loafers. I've got a wonderful collection of really nice lace-up shoes. Why would I want loafers? And he said, because your heart is so damaged, if you lean over to tie your shoes, it could kill you. Don't ever do that. You need loafers, you need slip-ons, you need something you don't have to bend over to tie. That's why you need loafers. And Lester went home. For the next three days, he was just living. He was so angry. He was angry at life. He was angry at the doctors. He was angry at his body. Angry, angry, angry. But he finally started to calm down a little bit. And he read. He had a huge library. He read books on psychology, on philosophy, on medicine, uh, on physics. He did everything he could. And he thought, you know, I'm 42 years old. If these books had the answer, I would have found it by now. And he got to thinking, he said, what do I really want? If I have a limited number of days, what do I really want? He made the decision. He just wanted to be happy. And he was thinking about how he could be happy. He thought, well, maybe if I was loved, I could be happy. But he remembered his parents really loved him a lot. Several women had loved him a lot. And he realized even though he was loved, it didn't make him happy. He had just about everything money could buy. It really had not made him happy. And he finally came to the conclusion about the only time in my life I've been happy was when I was loving he realized loving made him happy. And he thought for the rest of my days, I'm just gonna love. 
I'm going to love anybody I can possibly come in contact. I'm going to love myself. I'm going to love life. I'm going to love the doctors that gave me the bad news. I'm just going to love and I'm going to be happy. A strange thing happened. In about three months time, all of his physical illnesses went away. His heart healed. He fully recovered. He went back to work. As he got back to work, he thought, I'm just really going to change my life. I'm going to leave the Northeast. I'm going to move to California. As he began that journey to move, to start life all over again, he stopped in Phoenix, Arizona. He spent the night there. He'd heard about Sedona. He thought, while I'm close, I'm just going to check it out. He went to visit Sedona, and he liked it. And he stayed there. As he continued to recover and put his life back together, he learned how to let go of sad memories. He learned how to let go of bad feelings like judgment and unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness. He learned how to just constantly purge himself of bad thoughts. And he created something that he called the Sedona Method. For the next 42 years of his life, he spent his life loving people and helping them learn how to be happy. I feel like the Lord's led me to do a series on happiness. I read something this week about happiness, and the statement said, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. And so many of us have believed that something outside of ourselves could and would make us happy. What are the possibilities that your mind might not have always told you the truth? What are the possibilities that you have thought, if I could ever get a degree, I would be happy? If I could ever get another degree, I'd be happy. If I could live in a certain house, I'd be happy. If I could move to a certain neighborhood, I'd be happy. If I had this partner, I'd be happy. If my partner would make these changes, I would be happy. If, if, if. And how many times in your life when you thought something would make you happy, you got that something and the happy just just did not last. We hope that happiness will just fall out of the sky for us, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's up to us to choose and work at and develop a skill set for being happy. Last time, I shared with you some of the results of Professor Laura Santos. She's a professor at Yale University. Yale University has been there since 1703 been around a long time, over 300 years. She started teaching a class that was entitled Psychology and the Good Life. It's the most popular class that's ever been taught at Yale University. A big, big, big class at Yale would be 600 students. When they presented and offered this class to the student body, 1,100 students signed up for it. They wanted to take this course. Last week, I told you over a million people have taken this course online since they opened it to the public last March. That's incorrect. The most recent data I've had, and I'm sure it's changed since yesterday, is 3.2 million people have taken this course. This professor is on to something about happiness. It's going viral. She has a a podcast, The Happiness Laboratory or Happiness Lab. She's had over 80 million listeners. People would like to be happy. People know they're not happy. She started this course because she looked at the students in her classes and she realized they had more anxiety and more depression and more loneliness than she'd ever seen in students. 
And she thought, here these kids are in the absolute best times of their life. They've become adults. They're still in good health. They're surrounded by brilliant people their own ages, and it should be the best time of their life, and they're miserable. And then she thought, you know, even though she has three degrees from Harvard, she has a PhD in clinical psychology, she realized she's not as happy as she thinks she should be either. That's why the course started. Today, we're going to look at five things that research and science have proven increase people's happiness. So I would suggest to you these five things be social, be grateful, stay in the present moment. Rest and move. That's another one. And the last, the fifth, be kind. So in this study, we're going to look at the science of happiness. We're going to look at the theology of happiness. And we're going to look at the practice of happiness. If you don't intentionally practice being happy, you probably will not become more happy. Happiness is a choice. Some people think happiness is just a secular concept. It's the world's way. And joy is what God really wants us to have. Well, let's look at some facts. Let's look at the scripture before we come to that conclusion. Joy is definitely a God thing. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. Joy is the common denominator in the kingdom and the will of God as defined by scripture. We know about joy. We talk about it a lot. Happiness is also in the Bible. Happiness, the word happy, shows up in the King James Version of the Bible 28 times. The Greek word that's translated happiness is makarios. It shows up 50 times in the Greek language, It's often translated happiness. Sometimes it's translated blessed. Jesus in the fifth chapter of Matthew, when he's doing what we call the Beatitudes, blessed, blessed, blessed. Nine times he said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He gave us a list of things that will bring us makarios, happiness, blessedness. I really like blessedness when he says you'll be blessed, when he says you'll be happy, when he says you'll be makarios, you're going to become enviable. Don't you kind of envy people who just seem to have life by the tail and they're so positive and they're so happy regardless of what's going on around them? We as the body of Christ, as the light of the world, need to be happy people. Because unhappy people will see us and in time they'll start to wonder about us and they might ask and give us an opportunity to share our faith with them. So we're going to be talking about happiness for a few weeks. I have no idea how long until we run out and God says move on. And I felt like the Lord told me a couple of days ago when we run out of studies on happiness, the next one is going to be on spiritual intelligence. You're very much aware of IQ. We've talked about emotional intelligence. We're going to do a series on spiritual intelligence. That will probably carry us through the spring. we got plenty to study. So we're going to look in Scripture, and we're going to talk about these five things and how they have been proven by science to bring happiness. The first is be social. We're going to go to Acts Chapter 2, verse 42. I'll read it to you. This is talking about the early church. This is right after Pentecost. This is when the church is absolutely exploding in growth. They are so happy. They are so together. They, everybody is sharing everything. They had everything in common. And these are the four things they did in the absolute best times the church has ever seen. 
Verse 42, Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. So here we find the early church, when they were very, very happy people, they're social. They're together all the time. They're sharing their time. They're sharing their homes with each other. They're sharing their food, their possessions, and they're socializing. Of two of the things I'm talking about today, I want to point something out from my private practice in psychology is there are two ways in the human experience to discharge emotions. Now think about it. You get charged up all the time emotionally. Just about every time you watch the news, something's probably going to charge you up. It may be the political unrest. It may be the fraud. It may be the lies. It may be the corruption. It may be the riots. It may be the deaths. It may be the coronavirus. But those things just make us feel bad. They charge us up emotionally. When we get charged up, we need to discharge that emotion So the two ways as human beings, the only two ways I'm aware of to really discharge, to get rid of the bad feelings is vocally or major muscle movement. When we can think about men and women, women are much better vocally. It's not unusual if women are upset, they'll go lay down on the bed and just cry and get it out. They'll talk to their friends. They might even both talk at the same time, but they'll understand each other. That always fascinates me about women. The average woman, according to Dr. Gary Smalley, needs to speak about 24,000 words a day. The average man, about 12,000 a day. So women are just better at verbally and vocally discharging their feelings. Men, on the other hand, we're probably better at discharging our feelings with major muscle movement. That's why if we really get angry and don't like something, we might hit somebody. We might fight. We might knock a hole in the wall. Better way to do that is probably just get up, have a really good, hard, strong workout. If you've ever worked out really hard, whether you're male or female, if you'll notice, if you'll pay attention, you might have been emotionally charged up. But after that good, hard workout, it really helps you calm down and get back to peace. When we get charged up emotionally, we need to discharge an equal and proportionate amount. Think about it with the loss of a loved one, with a major illness, with the loss of a job or career, that's a big, big loss. It's really going to rock your world. You might need to do quite a bit of talking to get through that. You might need a lot of major muscle movement to get through that. But we need to discharge these things. And that's one of the things being more social does. We get together, we talk about things, we unload on each other, and it gets us back to equilibrium. That's a clinical word. A biblical word is peace. Peace, I would define for you as an absence of bad feelings. So we're instructed to be more social if we want to be happier. The people who are more social are happier. Statistically, the research has proven when people are tested for their levels of happiness, the top 10% are always the most social of the group being tested. There's a direct correlation with being happy and being social. The next thing we're going to take a look at is being grateful. Gratitude has been studied to help people. This morning was unusual. Typically, on a Wednesday night, I get to bed about 10 or 10.30. I usually get up somewhere around 4, 4.30, got up at 4.20 this morning. I usually study like a wild man. I try to memorize some more stuff. I try to get ready for three Bible studies on Thursday morning. This morning, God said, hey, let's just hang out. And one of the things I felt led to do is I got my gratitude beads. You can, you can see these. These were given to me by some friends who are not Christians. They have their own theology, their own belief system. It's similar to Buddhism. I'm not a mala kind of guy. These beads with 108 beads are called malas. And the Buddhists use them all the time for prayer and for meditation and things. And I thought I'm making my gratitude beads. They're lapis, which is my favorite semi-precious stone because it always goes with blue jeans. And I just like them. 
So I made it my gratitude beat. So this morning, I just walked in my living room in the dark, taking one of these beads at a time and saying, thank you, God, for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Didn't take any effort. I didn't have to think deeply to skew off 108 things that I am truly grateful for. I could have started into another 108 and then another 108. I just don't run out. And the things I was grateful for the first 108 times around were just present things. I can go back in my life and just come up with nearly an infinite number of things to be grateful for. When we're intentionally grateful, it always elevates our mood. It's been proven again and again and again that gratitude makes us feel better. It improves our health, it improves our mood, and it's proven it increases our productivity. Happy people are more productive people. It's a good thing to do. When we look at the scriptures, God told me several years ago, look at the prepositions connected with gratitude, with thankfulness. So in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the scripture says, be joyful always. Pray without ceasing in everything, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, in everything. Then if you go to Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. Some of your translations say, do not worry about anything, but in everything with prayer and, and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We talked about this before. Most of the promises of God are if then kind of statements. God promises, but we have to do our part. If we do our part, then he will do his part. Next time you have lost your peace, it will probably happen today sometime. You won't have to wait long. When something happens and you realize you've got some bad feelings, I define peace as an absence of bad feelings. When some bad feeling comes in, try this. Do your part. Be anxious for nothing. Do not worry about anything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. That's your part. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the peace that makes no sense. This is the total, complete, supernatural peace you can have in an economic meltdown as our national debt gets higher and higher, as more and more people are out of work, as more and more people die from the coronavirus. It's the peace that transcends all understanding. It comes when we use gratitude. So we should give thanks in all situations, with all situations, and we'll go to Ephesians 5.20, and I want to read that one to you. This is the big one. This is the tough one. This is for the A students in the class today. If you want to get an A in gra gratitude, this is it. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always, and hold on, and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, that's a big one. How in the world are you going to give thanks to God for everything? Well, thank you, God, for the coronavirus. Well, thank you, God, for the political craziness we're in. Thank you, God, for the rights. How in the world do we do that? How would that possibly make sense? It makes sense when you realize that in Proverbs 16, 9, God said, a man plans in his heart, but it's the Lord who directs his steps. 
And when you can remember Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So right now, God is using the economics and the politics and the health issues and the rights. He's causing it to work together for your good. It's very difficult to see now. I don't really see exactly how that's working, nor can I, but I can believe it in faith, and I can always believe it when I look back at my own life. The worst things that have happened to me, God has turned into the best things that have happened to me. Sometimes it took years for that to happen, but I really believe he does cause all things to work together for our good. So no matter how bad something is, you can honestly and faithfully say, thank you, God, for this. So always giving thanks in, with, and for everything. That gets you an A in the class of gratitude. The third thing that has been proven to elevate you and help you be better is staying in the moment. It takes people 20 minutes to recover from a distraction at work. That's quite a that's quite a recovery time. It's been borne out through research and science. When people stay in the moment, they're not scattered. They're not all over the place. As Dr. Jim Dennison told his congregation when he was pastor at Park City's Baptist Church of Dallas, he said, you can eliminate 95% or more of all of your pain and suffering by doing two things. Number one, refuse to regret the past. Number two, refuse to fear the future. Look at the last week of your life. How much of your time has been devoted to regretting the stuff that has happened just in recent history, regretting the rights, the unrest, the politics, the fraud, all that's going on, regretting how we have lost the way of life we used to have. How much of your time is going to fearing the future? When we look to scripture, we're going to see that God advocates living in the moment. When the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, okay. And he gave them what we call the Lord's prayer. And one of the things he said was, give us this day our daily bread. Oh my gosh, I'm the chiefest of sinners there. I'm always thinking about, Next week, next month, what's the stock market going to do tomorrow? I'm always thinking about those things. I'm getting out ahead of myself. I'm wondering, will I have enough money left 10 years from now, 20 years from now? If I live 30 more years, will I still have enough? Will I have more life than I have income? Will I have more life than money? I can get bogged down in that so quickly. I just have to let that go. If you think about it right now, you're fine. Right now, you're taking advantage of technology to be in a Bible study. You're in a climate controlled environment. I doubt anybody here is going hungry today. Everything is really okay. Bad stuff has happened in the past week. Bad stuff is probably going to happen in the future. But if we just stay exactly where we are right now, life is not that bad. And you can make it a very happy occasion. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus gave us the third of his do not worries from that chapter. Three times he said, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. In 6, 34, he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Would you be willing to trust God with tomorrow? And see, when we trust, we don't worry about things. We just don't. 
if one of my trusted friends says he'll stop by the bank when he's leaving here and make a deposit for me, I just don't give it another thought. He's responsible. He's trustworthy. Once I trust somebody, I can let go of something. Would you be willing to trust God with the future and obey him and stay in the present moment? And then in Luke 962, Jesus had some strong, strong words. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus was speaking to a bunch of agricultural people. They understood farming. It surrounded them. They saw it just about every day, unless they lived in one of the very few larger cities. And if they walked just a little bit, they were outside of the larger city and they could see people farming. Farmers knew you better not look back. When you're plowing the fields, you look across the field, you find a spot, you keep focused on it and you walk toward it. And that's what makes your rows straight. If you're plowing along and you look back, your row is gonna get crooked. It's just going to happen. So he, he uses an illustration they understood. Don't let the past hold you back. It's gone, it's done. It's not likely to change, let it go. This helps you be happier and happier. Research proves the people that stay in the moment are more productive, are more aware, are more connected to other people, do better work, have better lives and have more happiness. The statistics bear it out. It's a biblical concept. That's what we should do. Then we need to learn to move and rest. I've already talked about exercise. I am so looking forward to when we're done here about 11.30 or 12, I'm gonna change clothes, I'm going to the park. It's a bright, beautiful, sunny day and work out for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half today. It's gonna to make me feel better. I'm gonna enjoy the light, I'm gonna enjoy the movement, I'm gonna enjoy the exercise because this body really is not my own. It was purchased for a price. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of the living God. This is the body of Christ, and I would like to take good care of it because I'd like for it to last me at least another 25 or 30 years, and I'd like to enjoy living in this body, so I'm going to take care of it. The other thing is rest. I want to camp out there for a moment. We need rest. We need sleep. Most Americans don't get enough sleep. Most of the professionals say we really need eight hours of good, solid, uninterrupted sleep. And they've done the research. When people sleep well, their health increases, their intelligence increases, their emotional intelligence increases. They do better and they're much happier. I didn't do good last night. I got roughly six hours of sleep. That's not enough. I'm going to make up for it on the weekend. I'm going to sleep as late as I want to sleep on Saturday and do some catching up. But I'm trying to move to resting more. You see, God has a theology of rest. It's important to God. In Genesis, in the beginning, God rested on the seventh day. He modeled rest for us. He created humanity to start out in rest. And if you study what the Bible says about rest throughout all of scripture, all the way to Revelation, it's constantly talking about rest. Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a big deal for God. I used to think God had all those rules just to keep us from having a really, really good time. I've come to the conclusion he didn't tell us to do anything or not to do anything unless it will make our life better. That's the God we serve. Everything he tells us is an effort 
from his infinite wisdom to help us make our lives better. If God offers you rest, it would be good for you to receive it. So we look in Psalm 127. I like this verse. In verse two, it says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. Eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So we got a contrast. We got sleep and we've got anxious toil. Many of us, I know some of you guys, I know your stories, I know your lifestyles today. Busy, 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 hard, hard, hard working people. But according to scripture, it may be anxious toil. As a young man, my first job in ministry, I was at Wilshire Baptist Church. I averaged about 90 to 95 hours a week. I had no seminary. I had no experience. I had to learn on the run, and I worked a lot just trying to figure things out. And I felt good about that. I was proud of that. When I was at Lake Point Baptist Church, I took great pride in how busy I was. And I've realized so much of that was anxious toil. I've had days where I've just scrambled and churned and tried to get so many things done. At the end of the day, I felt like I didn't get anything done today. You ever have those days? You might shuffle paper, you might answer the phone, but nothing really seems to happen. And then other days, sometimes in two or three hours, I'll get three or four days worth of work done. It just really is amazing what happens. But God's saying, hey, I don't want my children in anxious, nervous, frightened toil. I want them to enjoy what they're doing. Adam and Eve, before the fall of man, I believe, loved their jobs. They had to do things like name all the animals and enjoy this absolutely perfect, flawless garden of paradise that they were in. After the fall, that's when the toil came in and men would have to work by the sweat of their brow. Got good news for you, Jesus broke the curse. And now we can get back to being led by his spirit, doing the things he calls us to do, and it won't any longer be anxious toil. And we can sleep. Many people, I'd say most of you on the call today, have long lists, maybe on paper, maybe on your computer, maybe in your head, but long list of things you need to do that you haven't done. I still have not written thank you notes for Christmas. I could find something every single night to stay up later and get less sleep. I'm just trusting God to get a reasonable amount of sleep nearly every night except Wednesday night just because I got a busy Thursday morning and I need to get ready for it. I just learning to trust God that when I've done a good day's work, call it a day, get some sleep. Now, I don't think he's going to bless you if all you do is sit around and watch TV 18 hours and then sleep. But if you're doing what you need to be doing at a reasonable pace, you can trust God to pick up the loose ends for you. It takes faith sometimes to just go to bed because you know there's always more you could do. There's always more you should do. Don't fall into the trap of anxious toil enjoy life. Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Your life should be light and easy. And as you learn to trust God, it's going to become lighter and easier and you will be happier. So we got to consider that. Then we go and we look at our last scripture in Ephesians Chapter four, I'm going to read this to you. The fifth thing we need to do is be kind. We're told in scripture to be kind. Research has been done. It is unnatural for human beings to enjoy hurting other people. Now, sometimes life is so hard on people, it corrupts them and they get to the place where they really like 
to destroy property. They like to steal. They like to hurt others. But research was done. Students were brought in in a laboratory setting, and there were two buttons in front of them. They had to push one of the buttons. One of the buttons would administer an electrical shock that was very uncomfortable to them. The other button would administer an electrical shock to a total stranger. Most of the students chose to shock themselves rather than hurt someone else. Other people were taken through exercises where they would put fake heads on a chopping block and give somebody a sledgehammer and ask them to smash this head. Well, they knew it's not gonna hurt anybody. It's a dummy. It's not a real live human head, but it, some of them just couldn't do it. It just felt so wrong. Instinctively, we were built and designed by God to be kind to people, not to harm people. At Stanford, one of the professors gave one of his classes an assignment over the weekend to share your time, your energy, and your resources with somebody who would benefit greatly from it. Well, most of the students were really anxious about that because it was getting close to midterms. He just really was uncomfortable with this whole thing, and, and but they did it. Nearly every time, there were a few rare exceptions. Every student said, I didn't feel like I had time. I didn't want to do it. I only did it because it was an assignment, and I thought I would just be more depleted when I was done with it because I was already frazzled and tired. Nearly all of them said, after I found somebody and shared my time, my energy, my resources with them, after I was kind to them, after I helped them, I actually felt energized. I felt invigorated. I felt better. I was able to go back and study more effectively than before I did it. We've got the data. We've got the research. Kindness makes people happier. So, would you be willing to become intentional about doing these five things more and more? The research, the science bears out. If you choose to do these things, it will cause your level of happiness to increase. Would you be willing to admit that many times in your life you have thought, if I could just have this, if I could just have him or her, if I could just do that, if I could just have this much money, if I could just have this salary, if I could just have this job, you thought you'd be happy, but once you got it, you found you still weren't really happy. Listen to the signs, listen to the scriptures. These are the things that will bring you happiness. It's not gonna just fall out of the sky. It's something you choose. There is no way to happiness because happiness is the way. It's a way of being. It comes when we make the choice, I'm going to be happy. I'm doing that more and more. I'll wrap it up with a story for you about Tammy Tatadie. I hope I said her name right. She grew up on the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation in North Dakota, just south of the Canadian border. She was one of four girls and she was the youngest. Her family had a grocery store business. She was the only one that chose not to stay in the grocery business. When she graduated from high school, she wanted to go to college, so she went. But when she was a child, she was extremely shy. She was excruciatingly shy. She said she'd move her face, her jaw, her mouth, but words just wouldn't come out. Her older sister said, we're not taking her anywhere with us. She is an embarrassment. People say hi to her. She won't look at them. She won't speak to them. They ask her a question. She opens her mouth and no words come out. She really suffered from extreme shyness. When she got to college, she chose journalism because she could write rather than talk a whole lot. 
And she started studying her Native American people. And she realized she'd been a little bit deprived. As she was growing up on the reservation, she attended Catholic schools growing up. And she felt like she didn't get as much from her own tribe as she wanted to. So she studied them. And she started building relationships with indigenous people. And she started participating in rituals. She started doing their ceremonial dances and she'd spend time in a sweat lodge and she'd study animal healing and herbal healing and things like that. And she decided really what she wanted to do was be a doctor. She wanted to make herself and her people proud of her. So she got her PhD in psychology. Along the way, she married somebody from her tribe and she had a baby. And if she had that one baby, she got a job. She was working with mostly white men. It was an interesting kind of situation for her. And they wanted to have another baby. And she lost two pregnancies. And that really rocked her world. It caused her to doubt herself. She started feeling like a failure around those white men that she was working with. She felt like an outcast. She lost 60 pounds. She became just a shell of a human being. And she finally came to the conclusion one day, Western medicine could not cure her. And she decided, I'm going to study the ancient practices of my people. And she created something that she called turtle medicine. And she decided she wanted to go back to the reservation and start a clinic for women and girls that would be totally, completely managed by women. It had never, ever been done. She got a partner. She moved her family back on the reservation. She opened the clinic. People said, Tammy, do you really think you're going to be able to survive financially doing this? It's never been done before. She said she never doubted because there's a difference between a vocation and a calling. She decided this was a calling and she became unstoppable. She got it up and running. Somebody asked her, said, what would you say is the shape of your life? And she said, the shape of my life is a turtle shell. I have to maintain it. I have to take care of it. Sometimes I need to retreat inside of it and shut out the rest of the world but I'm gonna have to come out to help my people. She decided she chose to live a life that was peaceful and quiet, that was not overcrowded. She chose to help people heal themselves. She decided she was gonna learn how to heal herself and teach others how to heal themselves. And she's had a significant amount of success. God desires for you to be happy. That word happy shows up in the Bible again and again and again, 28 times in the King James Version. The word makarios shows up more than that, about 50 times. God would like for you to be happy. In this series, we're going to talk about things that you can do that have been proven to improve your happiness. Connect is all about you finding and enjoying a personal relationship with God. And you are invited weekly to learn more about how much God loves you and is eager to connect with you. Dr. Burris brings 34 years of formal education and two earned doctorates in spiritual direction and psychology to guide you on your personal experience with God. More lessons are at the links below, and you can also keep up with us by following us on YouTube, Vimeo, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Our hope is that you'll connect with Jesus and let Dr. Burris encourage you in your journey.